Hello, everybody, and welcome to That Wrestling Show, the podcast where all pro wrestling matters. I am your host, Bill Yankovi, and this is kind of a free-range week here on the podcast. Uh, There's no real topic, you know, feature topic to talk about, although I will tell you that this week, going to preview Impact Wrestling's Rebellion Pay-Per-View, which is this Sunday night, And yes, folks, it is going at the same time as the Academy Awards, as the Oscars are. And I just want to thank Impact Wrestling for moving this pay-per-view one day, because it was originally going to be a Saturday pay-per-view, but they decided to move it to Sunday, and I don't have to watch the Oscars now because of that. So thank you very much, Impact Wrestling. You saved me from what would have been a miserable experience for me. Plus, going to get into some wrestling news um, and, you know, the plugs at the end. So, like I said, it's a free-range kind of show this week. Um, Not, I mean, got to talk about some news, give my thoughts, and, you know, get right to the pay-per-view preview. So, let's dive in and let's talk about some actually, I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to start with good news. Because it, it seems like... Wrestling podcasts, and and I'm guilty of this too, Um, you know, it it kind of starts off with bad news, and then, you know, you work your way up to good news. Well, I'm just going to start with good news, because this has been a really good week for Major League Wrestling. This has been a really good week. Earlier this week, they announced their new TV deal with Vice. That's right. The same people who bring you Dark Side of the Ring are going to bring you Major League Wrestling starting this spring. Uh, There was no official date announced for the start of Major League Wrestling on Vice, but uh, as soon as we get information, I'll let you know right here on the program. The other news is that they will have their first show with fans in attendance this summer. Want to mark the date down for those that are interested. It is Saturday, July 10th. It is going to be in Philadelphia at the 2300 Arena, the ECW Arena. And I'm going to read this press release that came out today from Major League Wrestling. Major League Wrestling today announced its COVID protocols for its return to the 2300 Arena in Philadelphia on Saturday, July the 10th. The event will be an MLW TV taping. Limited tickets available at MLW2300.com. The health and well-being of fans, the athletes, staff, and crew are of the utmost importance to MLW and the 2300 Arena. The 2300 Arena is following city and state guidelines for the latest capacity requirements and safety standards. The 2300 Arena recently replaced all its filters in their air system to HEPA grade, H-E-P-A. They also added UV lights inside their HVAC system. Hand sanitizing stations will be available for patrons throughout the arena. All seating will be socially distanced for safety, allowing fans to sit with their party, but following CDC recommendations regarding other attendees and spacing. There will be a COVID compliance officer on site for the 2300 Arena, as well as an additional COVID compliance officer from Major League Wrestling to ensure all protocols are maintained. Attendees, staff, crew, and athletes will be temperature checked upon entrance and must wear a mask while inside the venue. Pennsylvania's new guidelines as of April the 4th, 2021, allow maximum 20 or allow 25% maximum occupancy limited for indoor events. The indoor capacity is expected to after April the 30th. So that's only one week away. Scheduled to appear at this event include 
the MLW World Champion Jacob Fatu, Ross and Marshall Von Erich, the National Openweight Champion Alex Hammerstone, Mill Muertes, Filthy Tom Lawler, Myron Reed, Joseph Semiel, Mads Kruger, Alicia Toot, Azteca Underground, Calvin Tankman, the Caribbean Champion Richard Holiday, Akira Kwan, Myron Reed, Violence is Forever, Gino Medina, Conan, and more. More athletes and matches will be announced at MLW.com. Limited tickets available starting at $15. Tickets will also be available day of show at the box office unless the event sells out in advance. The general public doors will open at 6 p.m. with a bell time of 7 p.m. Now at 5.30 p.m., they have an early entry VIP, which is exclusive for price level one ticket holders. So really, a big news there from Major League Wrestling. They're going to have their first. They're going to have their first show with fans in attendance this summer, and it's going to be in July. Which you know, it gives them a lot of time. It gives everybody a lot of time, and. Also, it gives MLW the opportunity to get prepared, to be ready, and also gives the fans time because, you know, while we are getting into the spring months and eventually we're going to get into the summer here rather rather quickly, it, it, it may not feel that way right now, but believe me, folks, it's going to be here quicker than you think. Um... I think this is good for Major League Wrestling because they've been making a lot of moves uh, this last year as far as distribution goes, not only here in the United States, but throughout the world. They've been using um, YouTube to their advantage tremendously, and I think making this announcement is the first step for them towards coming back, and maybe, who knows, maybe something big will happen come July the 10th in Philadelphia. All right. So I'm pretty sure many of our listeners have been fired from their job before. I, I'm, I'm sure many of them have been fired. You know, I'm sure many of you listening to this have been fired from a job before. But how would you feel if your former employer gets your stuff, mails you the stuff, and it's in a trash bag, in a garbage bag. Well, that is what happened to Mickey James. And this has caused a lot of controversy. So, Mickey James posted a video on Instagram with her having the box open and the bag. And I'm actually going to play the clip so you guys can hear this real quickly. This is pretty fucking accurate how I got my stuff. Thanks, WWE. Okay, so that's Mickey James right there. That's the video. She goes to Instagram or to Twitter later that day, says, Dear Vince McMahon, I'm not sure if you're aware, I did receive my WWE care package today. Thank you. Hashtag always blessed and grateful. Hashtag women's wrestling matters. Well, this led to Maria Canales having a reply to which she said, Last year, I got one, too. So the same thing happened to Maria that happened to Mickey James. Well, Triple H took the Twitter, and this is what he said. Upon learning of the disrespectful treatment some of our recent released talent received on behalf of the company, we took immediate action. The person responsible for this inconsiderate action has been fired and is no longer with WWE. I will reveal who that person is in a, in a moment or two. 
Stephanie McMahon also replied on Twitter, at Mickey James, I am embarrassed you or anyone else would be treated this way. I apologize personally and on behalf of WWE. The person responsible is no longer with our company. John Laurinaitis, because, you know, we wanted John Laurinaitis to put two cents on this, was like, Upon learning of the disrespectful treatment of some of our recently released talent, we, the people power, took immediate action. The person responsible for this inconsiderate action has been fired. Uh, The John Laurinaitis impersonations can never go away. So Nick Aldis, the current NWA World Heavyweight Champion and husband of Mickey James, put up a poll on Twitter saying, I got home from the gym and there's a second FedEx box from WWE on the doorstep. What should I do? Well, there were three options. Tell Mickey, pretend I didn't see it, or live unboxing. 76% voted for a live unboxing. To which Nick Aldis replied, no more than six minutes later, spoiler alert, I'm pretending I didn't see it. So, then we find out Who was responsible for this? It was a gentleman by the name of Mark Carano. The story making the rounds among numerous WWE staffers and talents is that Carano is taking the heat for the Mickey James social media postings earlier, yes, or uh, postings earlier this evening, April 22nd with James revealing her belongings were sent to her by WWE inside a boxed trash bag. This led to other former talents claiming the same had happened to them. After the story began trending on Twitter, WWE executives Triple H, John Laurinaitis, and Stephanie McMahon all apologized and announced the person responsible was gone from WWE. PWInsider.com has been working to confirm Carano's departure when WrestlingInc.com broke the story. Carano had been recently replaced as the head of talent relations by John Laurinaitis, instead reporting to him. Carano had been with the company since 1998 and had been utilized on camera on WWE's reality series, Total Divas. Okay. First of all, I feel bad for not only Mickey James, but also for Maria Canales and to anybody else that had this happen to them. This is such a big sign of disrespect. I don't care who you work for, where you work for, if you get a box, if you get a package in the mail and it's your attire or personal belongings or whatever and it's in a trash bag, it's in a trash bag, I'd be pissed off too. I mean, this is such a sign of disrespect to the people who work at this company day in and day out. Also the fact that this is WWE we're talking about makes this story even worse for the company. Because let's say I'm I'm gonna pick a I'm gonna pick a random company. I'm gonna pick well, since I'm talking about Impact today, I'll talk about Impact. And, and I'm only using them as an example. Let's say Mickey James got fired from Impact Wrestling. And then a week later, she gets a package. And in the package is a garbage bag with her stuff in it. It would be big news, but because it's not WWE... At best, it would be, I don't know, maybe 
an underlining story for the week? I'm not really sure. But because this is WWE, because it is the most recognized wrestling name in the world, it's going to get big news. And boy, is this getting big news for the wrong reasons. I would never want to go back there. If if I knew my stuff, if, if I was treated like this after I had, you know, lost my job, it, it, this is beyond terrible. I mean, I'm glad that the individual who did this got fired from it. The problem is this kind of crap should have been resolved years ago. There should have been somebody that should have came out and said, hey, have any of you guys had this happen to you before? Because this is a bunch of BS. So the fact that it took a couple of people to do it, a couple of people to say this, and for someone to show the video of this happening is a good start. But this should have been dealt with years ago. There's no way in 2021 this type of crap should happen. I don't know why it was allowed to continue to happen, but it just was. And I feel bad for Maria... I feel bad for Mickey James. I feel bad for everybody, male or female, that has had this happen to them by WWE. Because this is absolutely ridiculous. And that is not the good sign of a corporation. It is not even a good sign of a place that you'd want to work five days a week. It just is not. All right. The other story that I want to talk about, and then I want to get back to some good news, is that, well, Charlotte Flair got pissed off at Dave Meltzer. Now, the last time uh, I talked about Dave Meltzer and women in general um, was when Dave made a comment about Peyton Royce. So... On Wrestling Observer Radio, Dave Meltzer made a comment about uh, Charlotte Flair uh, because she is out. She's for for those that don't know. So this week, uh, storyline wise, she got suspended from Raw for beating up a referee. The real reason why she is going to be off TV for the next few weeks is so that she can get some dental work done. I believe it's the jaw. I I, I believe that is what it is. So, Dave Meltzer makes this comment about how what Charlotte is doing or having done is part of, and I'm going to use quotes, a complete makeover. And then Dave Meltzer went into how WWE makes its talent subconscious about their looks. So Charlotte, and I'm going to give Charlotte Flair credit for standing up to this. She goes, you know, she she goes on the Twitter because, you know, we've all, we're all going on Twitter today, you know. So she makes the following statement. Yeah, I just listened. I thought Dave Meltzer would have learned his lesson last time commenting about women's bodies. But apparently, I'm fair game. So I get to respond. Again. To a rumor about my body. Again. You know what? This is when I stop. Dave, go to hell. And then, she later says... You have my phone number. It would take you 30 seconds to ask as opposed to giving straight crap to your listeners. Grow up. For you, of all people, to comment on a woman's looks. Do you have any shame, decency, or professionalism left at all? 
Find a mirror. Look hard, Dave. Okay, so like I said, this is not the first time that Dave Meltzer has done this. I I had mentioned Peyton Royce from a couple of years ago. I understand to a degree Dave Meltzer reporting, you know, Charlotte is having uh, dental work done. Okay, I understand that. He's doing his job. He's reporting. The comment about having a complete makeover and talking about how WWE makes the talent some that statement while it might be true and I said might be true probably should not have been said on radio really should not have been said um has Charlotte had surgery, you know, cosmetic surgery done on her before? Yeah, many times. We've seen it. And, you know, if you take a look... Actually, I'm going to challenge our listeners to this. I want you to go back, and I want you to look at a picture of Charlotte Flair. Two pictures of Charlotte Flair. One from WrestleMania 24 weekend when Ric Flair had the quote-unquote final match. And then look at a picture of Charlotte Flair from when she started at NXT. And then look at a picture of Charlotte today. This time. You can tell there has been work done on Charlotte, but I'm not going to say, you know, that... It's a complete makeover or, you know, WWE makes the people feel subconscious about their looks. Charlotte, from when she started at NXT, you know, working her way up, was an attractive young woman. She was. Is she still an attractive woman? Yes, she is. Has she had work done on her? Yes, she is. But I'm not going to say, I'm not going to go crazy and say, oh, you know, she's being forced to do this. Or WWE has her talent feel like they're ugly. Because Charlotte was never ugly. She was never ugly. And I think this is a kind of a situation where Dave Meltzer did a job of reporting a story, but went a little bit too far into expressing his opinions. So, I respect what Charlotte said. I think she said the right thing, saying, look, if you'd wanted the truth, you should have just called me. I would have told you everything. That's basically what she said. But, Instead, you know, it is what it is. And and I like and I like what she said, you know, I'm fair game, so I get to respond and basically saying, Melter, you're fair game as well. So I but you know what? It's like yeah, you can it's like you can have that thought. There's nothing wrong with having that thought. It's just you have to really watch when you say it and how you say it because that's what gets you in a lot of trouble. All right. Uh, the Hanukkah Memorial Show is going to take place on May the 23rd, which is going to be on a Sunday. And there is some good news about this show, and that is this show will be streamed live. It will be taking place at Kurakan Hall in Tokyo. Uh, this will be available to be seen around the world. Um, the platform has not been revealed yet. The event has been sold out. There are no tickets available for this. Uh, the card is going to be made up of three matches. Bell time will be 11.30 a.m. Japan time which means it'll be 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time on May the 22nd. 
Uh, there will also be at the show a memorial ceremony for this event. Um, I knew this show was going to happen. I'm glad to hear that the show is sold out. The tickets are sold out. I'm glad to hear that. And I'm also glad to hear that they're going to have a streaming service for this that hopefully, you know, wrestling fans will be able to see this event uh, to celebrate the life of a young woman who took her own life last year because there are some assholes in the world. I'll just say it like it is. There are some assholes in the world. Uh, Steve Mongo McMichael is in the news, and unfortunately it is not good news. It was reported on WGN-TV today that Steve Mongo McMichael has been diagnosed with ALS, otherwise known as Lou Gehrig's disease. McMichael was first diagnosed in January and announced he will no longer be making public appearances. McMichael said in this story that aired on WGN-TV, quote, I'm not going to be out in the public anymore. You're not going to see me out doing appearances. Hell, I can't even sign my name anymore. And everybody's going to be speculating, where's McMichael? What's wrong with him? I'm here to tell everyone I've been diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, so I'm not going to be a public figure anymore. WGN also reported a report noted that McMichael has lost the use of his hands and is now using a wheelchair to get around. He has only been given several years to live with the debilitating neurodegenerative disease for which there is no cure. Steve McMichael's career, he played in the National Football League from 1980 to 1994, played for three teams, the Green Bay or the New England Patriots, the Chicago Bears and the Green Bay Packers. After retiring from the National Football League, his first wrestling appearance was at WrestleMania 11 as one of Lawrence Taylor's all-star players when Lawrence Taylor fought Bam Bam Bigelow. McMichael would debut for WCW in the fall of 1995 on the premiere episode of Monday Nitro, joining the commentary team of Eric Bischoff and Bobby the Brain Heenan. Eventually, McMichael would step into the professional wrestling ring in the summer of 1996. His first match was a tag match with Kevin Green against Ric Flair and Arn Anderson. That eventually saw Steve McMichael turn his back on Kevin Green and join the Four Horsemen. Uh, McMichael would end up winning the WCW United States Championship in the summer of 1997 and would continue to be in WCW until 1999. McMichael also appeared at Bound for Glory 2008 as a referee in the Monsters Ball match between Beer Money, LAX, Team 3D, and the team of Abyss and Matt Morgan. A GoFundMe campaign has been launched to assist Steve McMichael with his medical care, and I can tell you guys, as of this recording, uh, this was created 15 hours ago. They have raised so far over $22,000 to help Steve Mongo McMichael. Uh, you know, I'm going to say this. I actually liked Steve McMichael in WCW as a wrestler. Was he the greatest wrestler in the world? No, he wasn't. But he was an entertaining guy to watch. I mean, he was in a weird way. And, and I and I know there are... Excuse me. I know there are some purists with... Excuse me. With the Four Horsemen. I'm going to be honest. Steve McMichael in 96 was a perfect fit for the Four Horsemen. Because if you think about the Horsemen, and, and I'll start with that incarnation, you had Ric Flair as the leader of the group, you had Arn Anderson, you had Chris Benoit. Each guy had a role in the group. 
But they didn't have a muscle man. They didn't have a strong guy. That's where Steve McMichael fit into the group. That's where he fit perfectly. If you look at the in, you know the, the the other incarnations of the Four Horsemen, each version had a muscle guy. The original version, it was Ole Anderson. After Ole got kicked out, it was Lex Luger. After Luger got kicked out, it was Barry Windham. Even though he wasn't really a muscular guy, he still you know had feats of strength. And then. When they came back to form the Horsemen in 90, Sid Vicious was the power guy of the Horsemen. And they didn't have a power guy when Paul Roma was there, because, you know, Paul Roma is the greatest member of the Four Horsemen of all time, apparently. And then when they formed the Horsemen with Brian Pillman in it, who I always would say, if Brian Pillman had not left... WCW in 96. He could have ended up being the best member of the Horsemen not named Ric Flair. So they needed a power guy, and Steve McMichael fit the bill perfectly. He really did. And no, he didn't have, you know, legendary classic matches that will forever stand the test of time, but he was an entertaining guy to watch, and that's what made me kind of like Mongo. So, um, I will post the link in the Facebook group and also in the description of this episode if you are interested in helping out uh, Steve Mongo McMichael with his medical bills as he and his family are going through a very difficult time and hope for the best real soon for Steve Mongo McMichael. Um, also want to talk about health issue uh terry funk it was announced yesterday on the in the observer newsletter and on their website that terry funk has tested positive from covid19 the report coming out is that he contracted it from attending uh, a church service recently or a church gathering Terry Funk is 76 years old, and according to Dave Meltzer, uh, Terry Funk recently contracted the virus and is doing fine outside being in isolation. Uh, Terry Funk canceled a, an appearance last March due to health reasons. It was reported earlier this year that he wasn't doing well, with Dustin Rhodes tweeting that Funk was experiencing a lot of pain in his hip, but that... He's a tough SOB. Funk last wrestled in 2017 and had performed sparringly in the years leading up to that event. Um, he last famously made some dates in 2016 following hernia surgery, despite his doctor saying he needed to take it easy. Um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this because I. My family has experienced COVID. I experienced COVID. It is not a fun thing to deal with. It sucks. Uh, It kicks your ass. And it has no care if you are Terry Funk or if you are some regular person with a 9 to 5 job. But uh, let's hope for the best. For Terry Funk, because God knows we need Terry Funk in this world right now, and if we don't have the Funker around, uh, this world's going to be a little different. So, uh, keep Terry in your thoughts, keep his family in your thoughts, uh, while he goes through a very difficult time. Some good news to report is Ronda Rousey. Uh, She and her husband, Travis Brown, announced that they are expecting a baby. This is Ronda Rousey's first pregnancy, uh, first time having a child. She is four months pregnant uh, in the video that they put up earlier this week. And, you know, congratulations. Congratulations to Ronda and to Travis for... Hopefully, the birth of a very healthy, proud, happy baby. Um, 
I do not know at this time if it is going to be a boy or a girl. Uh, Travis does have kids of his own from a previous relationship. So Travis will be a father for the third time. And Rhonda will be a mother for the first time. So congratulations to the both of them. Hope that their baby comes out or comes into the world. Like I said, very healthy and very happy. All right. This, oh, you know what? One more thing before I get into the pay per view. Uh, I wanted to talk about this past Sunday uh, the biography on AE of Stone Cold Steve Austin, and then WWE, I think it's WWE's most, or Treasures Most Wanted, or whatever it is. I, I want to talk about both of them real quick. The Austin documentary or biography was good, it was really good. Um, I enjoyed watching it. Got to learn a little, you know, new stuff about Stone Cold Steve Austin and what he'd been through. It was worth the watch. It was over a million people watched it, which is a good number for A&E. Um, it was enjoyable to watch. It, it was fun to watch. I, I enjoyed it. I plan on watching all the other biographies that they're going to put up on A&E. Uh, the next one, which is this Sunday, is going to be of... Rowdy Rowdy Piper, so that'll be something that I will either try to have recorded on the DVR or probably find it on demand and watch it as soon as I can. So that should be really cool. Uh, the other show, uh, WWE's Most Wanted Treasures. Um, this show is very interesting because it makes me realize once again that even though. A lot of you know me as Wrestling Man from over the years at Smart Wrestling Fan and other places. I have a life. I have a life. These people, with all due respect, do not have a life at all. Uh, They have so much memorabilia, it makes me kind of look puny. Um, I mean, I got a lot of videotapes and DVDs. I do have some autographed pictures. I actually have some coming in the mail from High Spots, hopefully within the next week or two. Um, and I got some old wrestling programs from the St. Louis Territory, which are really, really cool. But that's really about the extent of my collection. I don't really have much of a collection. These people have collections of stuff. Well, actually, I also have my action figures from when I was a kid. But... Um, so this one was Mick Foley, and he was looking for three items. Uh, he wanted an original Mr. Sacco. He wanted the Cactus Jack fleece vest, and he wanted his original Mankind brown shirt. Now, I'm going to be giving a little spoilers here for those that have not seen it and wanted to see it. So the first item he goes for is the sock. The guy that he gets it from says, you know what, for what you've done, for professional wrestling, I don't want anything. I don't want any money. I don't I don't want anything. I want to give this to you because of what you've done. So at least there's decent people in this world. Second person uh, goes for the vest, the Cactus Jack vest. And he's like, Oh, I don't really want to give it away. You know, it's an original. It's a cactus jack, you know, flannel. So the deal that they make is we'll give you a tour of the WWE inventory and you can get any item from there, which he ends up getting the barbed wire 2x4. So that's kind of a fair trade-off. And then the last person, which was the brown Mankind shirt, uh, ended up going for $7,500 and a pay-per-view party at his house with Mick Foley attending where they'd have pizza and wings and Vince McMahon would pay for the pizza and wings. So that's really it. As far as that show goes, eh, that one seems kind of scripted, but... 
I'm going to watch it just to see the items that they're trying to get. And also to give myself a better appreciation of, hey, I have a life. I don't collect all this crazy stuff. And where would I put this stuff? So, so that's basically WWE's uh, Most Wanted Treasures in a nutshell. But it also got me thinking to last night. Because last night, um, I was watching High Spot's Virtual Gimmick Table. And they had gorgeous Jimmy Garvin as the guest. And... He was auctioning some of his items off and some, you know, the proceeds were going to charity. Folks, the the piece of resistance, the, 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 the main item that if I had money, and I, and I said this to my dad this morning, if I was a millionaire, I would have gone for this. Jimmy Garvin auctioned off last night on the High Spots virtual gimmick table. A worn headgear, worn head, you know, head um, headdress from Wahoo McDaniel. Yes, the Wahoo McDaniel. It was, you know, it was it was the headdress. It had the feathers, it had you know, the bee, it, it was everything. And Garvin got this 35 years ago and it was in amazing shape. It was in amazing condition. I was amazed at how this was. It was absolutely beautiful looking. And like I said, if I was a millionaire, I would have gone for this item. I would have gone for this item. I, I know I, I know I just bashed the people on WWE's Most Wanted Treasures, and I'm kind of contradicting myself. I know that. But folks, if you had seen this headdress of Chief or of Chief Wahoo McDaniels, oh my god. You you would have gone like you would in your mind, you would have blown up and you would have been like probably trying to find any kind of money to go in to try to get this. So, the person, like the highest bid that I saw, because I even showed my dad the headgear, and he was amazed. So the highest bid was for $3,000. Which, okay, you know, for Chief Wahoo McDaniel headdress, I, I you know, that's a good price. But they're like, there was a private bidder. They bid more. Or they would have paid more for that. So I'm like, ah. Oh. So I will never know how much the Wahoo McDaniel headgear went for. Because I kind of want to know. I, I kind of want to know how much it went for. So I tell you what. If anyone can contact the people at High Spots this week and be like, Hey, could you tell me how much the Wahoo McDaniel headgear went for? You'll be my new best friend. Okay, so now we're going to get to Rebellion. It is this Sunday. Like I said, it was originally Saturday, but now it is this Sunday. Uh, this is a pretty loaded card. Every championship in Impact Wrestling is on the line. And normally, uh, I would go... From the bottom all the way to the main event. But this time I'm going to start at the top of the card and work my way down. Because the main event is kind of an obvious conclusion. Because the main event for this show is Rich Swan versus Kenny Omega. With both the Impact and AEW World Championships on the line in this match. This should be a very good main event. I mean, Kenny Omega in the title matches he's had has been really, really good. And Rich Swan's been really good as well. Both men have been excellent as of late. But, come on. It's Kenny. It's Kenny Omega. I mean, he, if you remember the promo he cut in December, he wants to be a collector of belts. He's already got the AEW World title. He's got the AAA Mega title. The Impact World title is the next thing. 
So Kenny Omega's winning that belt. Let's just say it like it is. Okay, the Impact Wrestling Tag Team titles are going to be on the line as Finn Juice, uh, David Finley, and Juice Robinson will defend the titles against the Good Brothers. Uh, you know what? I kind of see the Good Brothers winning the belts back. I think the the title change was just a short thing and uh, Gallows and Anderson are going to win the belts back. Now, uh, the Knockouts title is going to be on the line at this show. Deanna Perrazzo is going to defend against Tennille Dashwood. Uh, you know what? I think Deanna's going to keep the belt. She's arguably the best female wrestler they have in the division. And as much as I like Tennille, I, I think she's good. Deanna Perrazzo right now is just on a roll. Ever since she came to Impact, it, she's just been a different person. So I'm going to say Deanna Perrazzo will retain the Knockouts title. X-Division title will be on the line in a triple threat match. Ace Austin will defend against TJP and Josh Alexander. Uh, Alexander's had kind of a breakout ever since Ethan Page left Impact Wrestling and joined AEW. Uh They've been kind of focusing on him as of late, which is really good. TJP, multiple-time former X-Division champion. But I think Ace Austin is going to retain the X-Division title, although it would not surprise me if further down the road we see Ace Austin and Josh Alexander go at it for the X-Division title. This match is actually kind of an interesting match. Brian Myers against... Matt Cardona should be a very interesting match. Uh, they know each other very well. I'm going to say that Myers wins this match. I think he needs it more, and it would make a lot more sense for Myers to win than Cardona. Sammy Callahan is going to face Trey Miguel in a last man standing match. You know, Sammy Callahan, when he is on pay-per-view, I'm not going to take this away from him, even though I'm not a big fan of Sammy's. He can bring it. And this is a huge opportunity for Trey Miguel to elevate him to that next level. So this should be a very fun match. I see Trey Miguel winning this match, actually. I think he's going to go over Sammy Callahan. Okay, we're going to have an eight-man tag team match where Violent by Design, the team of Eric Young, Joe Doring, uh, uh, Rhino, and Cody Deaner are going to face this foursome of James Storm, Chris Sabin, Eddie Edwards, and Willie Mack. That's a very interesting combination, but very talented group of four right there. I'm going to say Violent by Design win this match uh just because of the con- you know of the of the teamwork there I think Violent by Design is going to win that match. And finally the Knockout Tag Team titles are going to be on the line as Fire and Flava Tasha Steeles and Kiera Hogan will defend the titles against Jordan Grace and her new tag team partner Rachel Ellering. Of course, Jordan Grace's original partner was Jazz. Jazz recently retired, so Jordan Grace needed to find a new tag partner, and what a better partner to have than Rachel Ellering. And, you know, I smell another title change here. I think the knockout tag team titles are going to change hands. Jordan Grace and Rachel Ellering will win the knockouts tag team titles. And... Just to mention this, Mauro Ranallo will be at Rebellion to call the main event of Rich Swan and Kenny Omega. So, a pretty good looking card for Rebellion, which is this Sunday. You can see it on pay-per-view. So many different ways you can see it. Go check it out. Should be a good show. If you, if you don't want to watch the Academy Awards and you don't mind forking some money over impact wrestling is the way to go well 
on that note, uh, that is going to do it for this week's show. So we're going to get into the plugs. If you guys have any questions or comments, send an email, wrestlingman at thatwrestlingshow.com. You can follow the show on Twitter, follow the show on Instagram. On Twitter, it is at wrestlingshow11. On Instagram, it is that wrestling show. Join the Facebook group. It is That Wrestling Show fan group. You type that in the search bar and you are right there. And if you can't find us, it's okay. I put the link in the description of each and every episode. And if you like what you heard here and you'd like extra content, go to our Patreon page, patreon.com backslash That Wrestling Show. We have three tiers of one, two, and three dollars. And $3 is the most expensive we go. So for $3 a month or more, you get extra content that you will not hear on the regular show. Now to mention some friends and other podcasts you guys should check out, starting with our Vantage Point, the Retro Wrestling Podcast with Joe Morata and Michael Quinn. This week, it is their season finale, and they defend professional wrestling. Plus the finale of the Royal Flush of the worst WrestleMania main events. And they review an episode of the Family Feud, the Ray Combs years with the WWF and the WBF going at it. That is this week on our Vantage Point. Also check out greetings from Allentown with Peter Winston. He watches one episode of wrestling each week. This week he watches and discusses an episode of of Shotgun Saturday Night from April 4th, 1998. This would be the weekend after WrestleMania 14 took place. Plus, GFA Live with him and Keithy Langston as they watch World Championship Wrestling from April 13th, 1985. Check that out. And also check out Juice Pro Wrestling, where this week Juice, Bodie, and Shredden talk about the Cannibal Cookout, That is happening on April the 24th, featuring Handsome Prick, Sexual Atrocities, Putrid Pile, and more. Plus, they discuss Samoa Joe and recent WWE cuts, the Rebellion pay-per-view and its ramifications, and much more. That is this week on Juice Pro Wrestling. If you are looking for non-wrestling related podcasts, check out the Best Pick Movie Podcast with Tom, John, and Jess, three people who love movies, and they watch each and every Academy Award-winning Best Picture winner in no particular order. This week, they discuss the Best Picture winner of 1957, The Bridge on the River Kwai. Also this week, they have a crossover episode with the Writers Panel. They are joined by Ben Blacker as well. That just came up today. They got a busy weekend coming up because they're going to watch the Academy Awards this Sunday, which is like Monday morning over there in England, so you'll be getting a, a special episode there as well early next week. Also, check out Last Stop Penn Station with Carrie Silken and Ian Riccoboni as we look into the life of Carrie Silken. This week, it is all about more stories and characters, plus, Ian recounts his time at Disney World. That is this week. On Last Stop Penn Station. And Ian, if you listen to this, because I know you went to Disney World, you should check out The Castle Vault, which is a chronological deep dive of Disney animated films powered by Disney+. Plus. This week, the guys discuss Monsters University. That is this week on The Castle Vault. Also check out Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast, where this week they interview comedian... Or comedy musician and Weird Al fan Chris Waffle of Mega Thruster. He is the lead singer of Mega Thruster and is behind the anti bullying anthem Weird Al Rules. That is this week on Dave and Ethan's 2000 inch Weird Al podcast. Also, check out Shark's Pond, a South Park podcast where I watch, review, and discuss each and every South Park episode. This week, it is the end of Season 11 of South Park as I review the Season 11 finale, The List. That is this week on Shark's Pond, a South Park podcast. 
And this weekend, check out the brand spanking new podcast, Bill Learns Kingdom Hearts. Join Jim Boy Store and I where I watched 30 minutes of Kingdom Hearts, the video game, on YouTube. And I discuss with Jim what happened in the 30 minutes that I watched, talked about what I like and didn't like, and so much more. This week's episode is titled, A Whale of a Time. That is this weekend on Bill Learns Kingdom Hearts. You can find that podcast on Spotify and iTunes. Okay, next week on the show, going to review Rebellion. Hopefully it's going to be a really good pay-per-view. I think it's going to be better than the Academy Awards. It's going to have a better gate than the Academy Awards, I'll tell you that. Plus, an annual tradition here, I am going to make my pick for the Kentucky Derby. The Kentucky Derby is next Saturday, so I will make my annual pick of who will win the Kentucky Derby right here next week. So until then, everybody, have a good, safe weekend. Uh, Have fun, no matter what you're doing. And when you're done, come back here next week for another episode of That Wrestling Show, the podcast where all pro wrestling matters. And as always, wrestle on.